welcome to Discography, the music podcast that delivers the objective truth about the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever existed. I'm your host, Dave Gebro. In this episode, since it is entitled Objectively and Unquestionably the Greatest Lou Barlow Interview of All Time, we will be turning our spray cans on Lou Barlow. So, if you're tuning in for the first time, I just quit my job a few weeks ago while putting the Pavement series together. Because I do it all, which requires stupid amounts of time. Everything from obtaining the guests, doing all the social media, all the recording and editing, you name it. And I love it. I'd have it no other way. The last six weeks of my career as a hearing instrument specialist was spent literally editing and promoting the Pavement series eight and a half hours a day, nonstop, until there was nothing left to do but leave. So why am I telling you this? Because I'm doubling down on Discography. My wife and three-year-old son are doubling down on Discography. We're selling our house and planning on living as frugally as possible on the East Coast. And all of that just to ensure that Discography is the standard bearer for all that's awesome about music. So don't go anywhere when this episode's done. Subscribe. Coming up, we have four fucking weeks of that metal show's Jim Florentine rating Black Sabbath, then two weeks of Randy Randall from No Age rating Jesus Lizard, then Sergio Diaz from Os Mutantis rating his own early work, and on and on and on way, way into the future. Here's what I'd love for you to do. Check out all the back episodes. Trust me, they're all as good as the one you're about to hear. Share the ones you dig with your friends, post them all on your various pages and accounts, and tag me on the posts. I promise to join in. Also, join our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. We're on Instagram and Twitter, too, in case you don't mess with the Zuck. Also, please rate the podcast five stars, along with a beautifully worded review, especially if you're listening to the show on good old Amazon Music or, of course, Spotify. It'll help a lot. The link to our legendary playlist is in the show notes and also on our website at discography.com. And if you're like me and enough's just never enough, then visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Our Patreon feed is the ultimate music deep dive. I post three shows a week. The main show on Sunday, then Discography is the private press with Paul Major on Tuesdays, and a Thursday wildcard episode, which is either an interview with that week's guest, or one of our other offshoot shows like Rock Cousteau, Queasy Listening, and Battle Royale. So hey, try it for a month, you've got nothing to lose. Okay, back to business. First things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Discography is heavily researched and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. We're not just covering albums, Uh uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and bootlegs. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between zero and five, which allows us all to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. And away we go then with Lou Barlow as we scale the lush topography that is the man himself. I'm going to start with the Zombies episode itself and allow you to see as it organically veered into an interview. Enjoy what I have called, albeit rather lengthily, but seriously, very honestly, objectively and unquestionably, the greatest Lou Barlow interview of all time. Phase three, the freedom of going for broke when nothing matters anymore. A notion that I'm guessing that... uh, that you and I are both intimately familiar with. 1967 to 1968, Odyssey and Oracle, recorded during the Summer of Love, released in 68 after it was too late. I'm guessing you're familiar with the whole story of, you know, this is kind of like we're over, but let's just like one more for the road kind of thing, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I am familiar with that. So, you know, I can't even think of a corollary Is there any other corollary where like a band produces uh, a stone cold masterpiece that's, you know, seen as uh, as being on a level of Sgt. Pepper, but the band was done by the time it came out? Well, um, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I guess. Well, that's the thing about the zombies. They they just were like, okay, we're not going to do. I mean, like the pretty things. I mean, were they they did SF Sorrow. Right. I mean, but they obviously continued far beyond that maybe they were more popular i mean SF <laughs> you know because after sf sorrow came parachute and parachute has like two or three great songs on it um the title track itself is astounding 
but he had a lot of really pedestrian stuff on that. So, but were they? But they maybe they were just more of a functional band. Like me doing music, it's like you don't you don't continue because people like you. <laughs> you just you just keep doing it. You know, you you keep yeah. doing it because I mean, it's not like you know, you're like like whether something is is a is a failure well, so, or not. So so toward that <laughs> end and toward that way of thinking. What was the most difficult time for you to make music where like you had things that were encroaching in your personal life that made it hard to connect with the muse, but you knew that this is, you were a song and dance man. So you had to just, you know, well, wake up and, and hit record. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I guess after like 1999, Sebado had done a record called the Sebado for Sire records and Falk Implosion had done a record called one part lullaby for Interscope. And Sabado were dropped two weeks after the record was our record was released. Um, one part lullaby. Uh, it was a duo. It was John Davis and I, but John Davis, you know, quit um, or upon like um, pretty much upon the release of the record. So I was left with these. So it was you know <laughs> it was. So yeah, then like I guess I you know after that like two thousand two thousand one two thousand two two thousand three two thousand four it was like so that's yeah. around the time of emo right yeah like I did emo was kind of my comeback in a way but uh, there's some great stuff on that man I mean that really was how do you feel about that stuff now like when you look back at um, at those seven up uh, I I mean I, I hear a lot of pain on those records so I, it one part lullaby and the seven I. One part lullaby is i feel like to me it's it's still like uh i feel like it's one of the strongest records i've ever ever been a part of and the sebado it's like i uh i don't know i mean i i it's hard for me to separate the the turmoil that was surrounding those records and i was really i was really i was having a really i was having a really hard time that was my own that was my that was like my drug time Huh. And I and I was just like, but the saving grace was that I touring and stuff like got me not straight, but it got me like um, it got me out of bad stuff, and I was able to sort of do a little relay race with my addictions, and was able to. Um, did you have to go to any treatment kind of thing, or did you just? No, I just went on tour. That was the only time as a fan of yours that and i'm you know i'm coming at your stuff from a different angle probably but then most of the people who um you know who would prefer that you have a full band and all this stuff but um i would say harmacy and the sebado i i just couldn't connect with um uh with what was happening there it just wasn't yeah, i I, was, I, did, I didn't i i harmacy was a huge i heartbreaker for me i didn't I liked I liked the Sebado better because I liked the band better. That we we had like there was we had a better we had a drummer and the music was a little more alive and Jason Lowenstein songs were really strong. But I for myself I guess yeah I, I would agree. <laughs> I wasn't really, I don't think that was you know, yeah I'm not I, saying anything super controversial. But you're, no. you're just like the zombies. I mean you're you're uh, you're such a, an incredibly super affecting ballad writer that uh, that I'm always hunting those songs down. Mr. Genius Eyes or um, Slutty Suggestion, um, some of the ones that that flirt with um, with notions of magic, not not Presto Changeo either. Uh, and I'm curious actually how much of that is just like flirtation with a concept, and how much you were actually if you were doing any Crowley related stuff at the time, <laughs> were you? I was really into the, the, the band, the Swans at that period. And yeah. They were like, they were kind of like this sort of quasi satanic, <laughs> like, uh, they had a bit of very interesting thing that they were pursuing at that time. They did a record called children of God. Um, they, they were going in and out of like a lot of, pretty heavy concepts. I don't know. I took it all very seriously. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I was like, I mean, I just love recording. I just love getting high and recording. So I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I was working at a nursing home. So I was like, it was working night shift at night shift at a nursing home doing psychedelics. 
Oh, uh, like like Keezy with uh, cuckoo, Cuckoo's Nest. Were you thinking <laughs> along those lines? <laughs> no, I don't know what I was. I don't know what I was thinking other than ex- I just wanted to experience, you know. And I did. I mean, I had yeah. I had a really I had an absolutely beautiful. I had a life changing acid trip when I, I went to work on acid, and it was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. What, yeah. what, what did anything happen specifically to make it that way? Uh, I was just everything that I did that day was just unbelievably. I mean, like I gave a guy, you know, it's just stuff that I did normally. Like I gave a guy a bath, you know, this where you, you roll him into this big shower and then you, what year is this? It would have been 86. Okay. Okay. I, I thought you were talking like late nineties. Okay. Oh no, no, no. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I, you got me on, you were talking about read forest and yeah, so I yeah. talking about that um but yeah late 90s i don't know i mean i i actually made a lot of home recordings around that time and i put out a i put out a cd in 2001 called songs from lubicore that has like 23 songs on it it's all home recorded stuff which i really i still really like i like that record quite a bit that was i, I thought that was probably in retrospect, I think it's probably the most interesting thing that I did between like 1998 and you know whatever. I mean, other than I do really like one part lullaby by the Falk Implosion. I don't know. I, re- I really love the original Losing Losers, uh, yeah. especially yeah. Uh, uh, o- Only Losers and High School. Oh, oh, and Drag Down Memory. I mean, those three songs are really, really powerful. I I worked. Those, yeah, that was my, that was my passion. I was really, really, really into it. <laughs> was there an inspiring uh, leap off point moment that, uh, or a series of moments that led you to believe that um, whatever you were going through at the time, which obviously involved tremendous amounts of masturbation and pot smoking, <laughs> um, that, 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 that your task camp could be used as a, as a therapist couch. W- when did these notions kind of start to coalesce because when I listen to, you know, you're living all over me and you know, all those seminal records, look, Jay, I'm not comparing you guys, but you obviously have two different aesthetics. Jay is bringing elements of classic rock into the mix and, you know, Sabbath and Zeppelin and, but you're, and, and it's all amazing and all working really, really well, but you're doing something there that I've, I've never heard before. So where did where did it come from, or was it an accident? Well, I I started recording like on I mean a lot of like losers losing losers a lot of that stuff was rec- not a lot but there's there's stuff that I recorded when I was in high school I started recording on portable tape recorders as soon as I you know was able as soon as I I just you know squirreled away the family you know condenser my tape recorder to my room and just started fucking with it and then also recording things on the recorder then playing them back out through a stereo and we're doing like you know crude multi-tracking but all the stuff that i was doing was really kind of jokey and very short but very hardcore influenced you know like it was very influenced by really short songs and hardcore was such a, a to me it was such a confessional music you know like I mean, some, something like Black Flag, I mean, it's all very like inward, you know, and you know, a lot of introspection and even stuff like Minor Threat and, you know, like punk rock to me was, was, um, was inter- was actually interest. I considered it introspective music. I considered a lot of hardcore songs to be in, you know, things like Husker Du and a lot of, a lot of inward looking stuff. So when I kind of emerged from, you know, being, you know, when I started smoking weed and, you know, I left when I graduated high school and started smoking weed and slowing down. And that's when I first, I just, when I first sat down and wrote a song where I, the lyrics kind of made sense, you know, where all of a sudden I was like, oh, okay, now I can, I, I just started to realize that I could, I started writing songs, you know, where I was actually talking about, yeah. you know, that's when I, so that's where it came from. I know I never, it was just a, it was just a, a pretty steady progression from, when I first picked up the guitar really or in the, and started recording and, you know, so from the, from the age of 12, you know, I, I started recording. But do you remember the first, the first thing where you, uh, where you got it out of you, whatever it was, and you were blown away by what you had done? What was there? Was there one track that did that for you? I, I, I can't, I mean, I recorded hours and hours and hours of yeah yeah stuff and did everything uh, out there too. Did you put everything out? 
everything everything is almost is out i mean especially since i did i did the subscriber series thing with joyful noise a couple like two years ago and you're living with your parents at the time oh yeah no i was okay. living in the attic they're you know like, i think what and they're like what the fuck is he singing about up there <laughs> yeah well, they, they wouldn't know i mean also deep wound was practicing at the house too you know so they it was just a i was constant there was some kind of noise coming from i eventually ended up in the attic of my parents house where i could really really let it out you know <laughs> and then, i can't even imagine like yeah you know, mom dad i have this a new song i just wrote and you're sitting around the kitchen table while you're playing albuquerque 89. <laughs> <laughs> no so that they i was working a night shift so they were gone during the day as i would wake up you know i'd go to work and then i'd wake up at like 11 or 12 and just start smoking and recording I, it was old, a very, how old at this time I would have been uh, 19, 20. Okay. And so, do, you still, do you still work in that way? Do you still get the same charge out of working that way? I can't really work that way. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I got young children. I've got, like, I can't. It's like I have to be. I mean, I, I do. But having said that, like my wife, uh, my wife and I have, you know, these wonderful days at home where I just, I'm upstairs, like, banging away on something or and she's downstairs knitting and i mean your music is very personal it's the opposite of product it, it's it's a glimpse into who you are so now that you have kids and everything and they're able to see this glimpse of who you are is that fucked up for you it's gonna be a while before they really see what i've done i mean they're pretty young like my daughter's 17 i don't think you know, I'm I'm their, their their dad. Like they 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 looked to me to take them places, and you know, I'm 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 in service to them. You know, I yeah, I think that's a that that's a that's a choice that I had to I did make that choice. You know, it's like I was like I'm, you know, I know there there are people there are musicians who are just like you know, I'm not going to be available right now, and they they can they go to an office somewhere or they go to a you know studios and sort of lock themselves away or. My family is like the most, that's the most important thing right now. I think I'm trying to set myself up now for hopefully like a very rich uh, latter part of, you know, <laughs> rich, like creative latter part of my life. I'm kind of setting myself up for that now. What do you, what do you foresee? I mean, is there anything different than what you have set up at your disposal now? No, I want to, I want to, I want to do, I want to build a studio. I want to like, I have a lot of stuff that aren't, it's not in my reach right now, like for financial reasons and for personal reasons. So I, I have to, I'm, I like right now, I do what I can to like give a hundred percent to what I have, but I have to do it. Like I have to do it on the, on the schedule of being a father and yeah, yeah. the emotional and the emotion and the, and the responsibilities that like every responsibility that that entails, that's number one. And then everything, you know, so it takes me, so, you know, I don't have those, like I, what, what, what I was describing in the way I worked when I was a kid, those are like spasms, you know, those are like spasms of creativity. And it's totally, it's all about like, you know, just like absolute freedom. <laughs> yeah. So, and I don't, well, and, and obviously and, it's a different time. You're doing it as a kid, obviously, but um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I would love to, I, you know, I don't really have, I guess the way that I've lived my life, I've, I guess when we talk, when you talk about regrets and things like that, it's like, I don't really, I mean, I work with Jay, like Jay Mascus is a, he's, he's someone who's done, he's done it right. You know, he's got this wonderful studio in his attic and his career, the way that he plays and he has, you know, assistants that come in and record, help him record things and set things up. And like, and his, his life is, he has a very integrated family life, but his, his creative thing is like, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the top of the pyramid, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but the way that I've lived my life and, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, just the, the, some of the choices I've made and some of the things I've been through have, have, have made it. So I'm always, I'm always kind of struggling in some way. So How, that's what do you mean? struggling, struggling to integrate that. You mean? I, yeah, I'm just always trying to figure out a way to integrate my creative life with my personal life. I, just it's just a maybe yeah. it's just the way that you're it's per, potentially the way that you're seeing it because you know even the little facebook videos that you post of um 
what your daughter's name is, is, is um Izzy. Yeah. Izzy? yeah yeah so like the, where she's all dressed up and she's got like you know you got she's letting um or you're letting her dress you up and do stuff that, you're you're and you're playing music while you're doing this it's mm -hmm. all it's all integrating without you needing to get in the way and do it with capital letters yeah yeah, yeah. And like my, you know, I went to film school and all that jazz and I'm making at the second that lockdown happened, I wrote a script for an Elma movie and I made an Elma movie with my son. And these are the, you know, it, it maybe doesn't need to be this big overarching effort. I mean, it could just be the, it looks like you're doing it is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, I am. I'm keeping it alive. <laughs> <laughs> but it's but these are these are primal. St I don't know about for you. I'm sure it feels this way to you. Be right before a lockdown, the the several months leading up to lockdown, I had uh, kidney cancer. They had to operate. Then I had oh my, a, oh my god <laughs> severe spinal stenosis. So they had to do an operation. Oh my god! Through the front, and it went south. So that they then ten days later, after my left arm went completely limp, they had to do it from the back, and I had to relearn how to walk. And oh my after, god! After thirteen years of recovery, I was now on morphine and Norco, oh. and uh, my wife got you know a, um, a let go from her job during that time. I was on uh, I was on disability for a year, and uh, you know, and it, after seven miscarriages. We had uh, we had our son, and he was six months old at this time, and I was like knocked right off the perch, you know, um, um, and you know, uh, so the primal stakes of right now: should I pick up a guitar or should I hang out with Izzy? <laughs> I, I understand that. the yeah. waves of guilt and of remorse, and I can't just have a simple emotion around those things yeah it's true it's very difficult to do that um yeah. but go, go look going back to freedman weed foresting era demos uh i want to refer them as demos because i'm curious if you thought that these were going to be demos for a later project and that at some point when you realize holy shit, this is actually the final version uh I always, whenever, well, back then, whenever I did something, it was the final version as far as I knew. So this was never with any, um, with any intention to recreate with like background singers and horns later in the studio. No, no, never. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I make demos now, but, uh, I did not make demos back then. <laughs> so how, did, how did things evolve with, with Eric? And I don't, I honestly don't know your relationship with Eric, but what was happening at that time that uh, allowed you to coexist as creative partners? Uh, well, we were both dating women that worked at the Smith College radio station. <laughs> well, he he had actually he his girlfriend was best friends with my, but she became my my first wife, but. Uh, so we, but Eric and I had, we'd actually started hanging out. Um, I don't know why did we, I, well, he was a, he was a deep wound fan and he played in a bunch of bands and he and I started to hang out and we actually started to go to like Bible readings together. We started, really? Yeah. We were like, Wait, we were like, you, are you we, religious now? No, I mean, I'm interested in things, but I, you know, I, I, uh, at that time, Eric and I were both like, we were, we were sort of flirting with this idea of being like these pothead Christians, I think. Hmm. Cause I used so much, I used, uh, I had a lot of like Jesus imagery in my songs. He was one of the first people that I played music that I would play my give tapes to, you know, that's kind of why we, I, I can't remember why, I don't know why I felt safe with him <laughs> to give him my, my music, but I did. And we kind of, I just thought he would be a good person to to play music with because he was so crazy like he was just he was so uninhibited he was really uninhibited he was like he had this real like real he really loved the 60s and he loved the beatles but he you know but he loved flipper and yeah. 
you know, we, we just, we loved hardcore and the Beatles and all this stuff together. And we kind of had the same, our tastes were similar. We just had like, we yeah. loved acoustic music and we loved like, just terror, like just creating terror and confusion, you know? Yeah. And uh, he was really good. At, he, he would just literally do it. I mean, he would do it on the streets. I mean, he was like, we would play on the streets together. He would go to mo he would go to open mic nights and just fucking get thrown out by like the these angry angry hippies, you know, in Northampton. <laughs> just like get the fuck out! I mean, he was just we. Would, I mean, we were assholes. I mean, we were just really like just these. Because that was kind of the point back when we started was just to make this kind of acoustic music, but just be I. I I don't know if just to be assholes was the point, but it was kind of the point. It was like to be, you know, antagonistic, it could be confusing, you know. Was that um, was that relationship not built to last? No, it was not built to last. <laughs> it was a personality based thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think it, it just complicated things when when the band started to get. Um, popular and then people kind of focused on me I think that was hard for Eric you know I mean I did I was very I was pretty assiduous about making sure that everybody knew that we were like an equal partnership and that it was all about both of us and you know I made the records that way we were 50 50 splits I was very I really was like doing what I thought was necessary to like gain uh, you know to gain Eric's trust and show him that like we were partners and I was 100% behind him and but I think just the actual you're reality. Talking, you're talking back in the 80s or you're talking? Yeah, 80, 89. I mean, we put out our first tape in 80, 80, 88, or I think 88 or 89. I was still in Dinosaur Jr. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't really, I mean, it was just that. And then uh, I just liked it as a, like that we were this, this acoustic thing and put out these weird tapes. And then uh, yeah. when I got, I got kicked out of dinosaur and Eric was like, we got to form a band. And I, I was like, I don't want to form a band. And he's like, let's form a band. I know this kid who plays drums. So we did. So that's when Sabato became a band. And that's mm -hmm. when we start, we started to, you know, record in studios and stuff. But, uh, but then when the band and got, and that, what year is that? That's uh, 90. It would be eighty nine, ninety. Okay, and then and then. Uh, What's the first studio recording you guys did? Um, we did, we did some songs that are on seven hundred three. We we did a song called "Scars for Eyes." Right, right, right. Um, Great shit, man. I love that record. Yeah, it's a. That's I. We you know, Eric and I had a. We had a really. We had a. We had a brief, really nice period where we were working together and. And uh, then, you know, 703 kind of came out and because it was sort of, it did pretty well, you know, yeah. <laughs> it kind of, it kind of really, it, it uh, I don't know. And then because I had always made it clear that I was like, Eric, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to work with me if you don't want to, you know, like I was just, I don't know. I was just so, I just. You know, like was, a fucking dream partner, especially because you're, <laughs> you're, you're legitimately bringing more to the table than he is. Yeah. But I, I didn't really mean it. I, I. I don't know. I, I guess I could look back on it and figure out exactly what to regret about it. But I, you know, I did like, I really did want, I just thought at some point he would, I just thought he would, he knew that I was on his side, you yeah. know, and then, and I was kind of bending over backwards to, to prove that, which I think, which I found, of course, over the course of my life is just never though. I just doesn't work with people. Like it just doesn't work, you know, just trying desperately to accommodate somebody at some point they're just they're like i don't know it, it just erodes respect i don't know what it is yeah. it just it doesn't it doesn't work i mean we're well, definitely i'll tell you you know this is not the first or last story about <laughs> uh tumult winds up fueling a creative relationship because you guys had something that had a um that has a balance to it uh that is you can't put your finger on it there's a you know it's just it's unto itself like if you, you know, the stuff on Bubble and Scrape, I mean, his his songs are complete and utter madness. <laughs> and they really are. They're fucking yeah. shit crazy on there. Yeah. Uh, and but the way that your material counterbalances it, it is a it's a really good give and take. Ultimately, yeah. there's uh, there was never any question that it was that Sebado was was you so the fact that you were uh no matter how you split it up 
um, because of your grasp of what Sebado was um, at that time. So, and my, by the way, my favorite song is, uh, uh, what possibly could be my favorite Sebado song is on, is on three, no different. Yeah. That's a great song, man. Um, <laughs> you know, I read the Azerod book and, you know, obviously very familiar with, uh, you know, everything you guys have done. How unexpected was this turn of events that you guys would, uh, would get together and get along as famously as you are? It was totally unexpected. I mean, who made the, who made the first move? Uh, his management, you know, okay. art, which became, you know, my management as well, you know, through the band, not my, but the band's management. Um, you know, there was the reissues for the first three records were coming out and the management had, were like, Jay, you know, what would be really great. I mean, at this point, Jay, I had actually gotten on stage with Jay to do a Deep Wound song uh, at a benefit, a, a benefit here in Western Massachusetts. Uh, and we had reunited Deep Wound for one song. And so that was kind of like the opening of a door, I guess, you know. Yeah. And Jay actually, to his credit, like he, over the years, he would actually go to Sebado shows and, um, would he heckle you? No, no, I mean, he's, he's, you know, he's a very quiet person, but I, I, um, I mean, he, he even came to one once where I got drunk at the end and ended up like screaming at him. You know, he was like, hang, he was like hanging out with, he actually brought Kevin Shields to the show and we were all having a conversation. And then Jason said something that just triggered me, you know, like put me back in the old, you know, like the old days. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. You know, like, <laughs> And my mom was there and it was just horrifying. Oh it was horrifying. Like, oh God, <laughs> like what's going on? But, you know, so like, like I said, like to his credit, he, he did show up and to support, to support my stuff. And then we did end up doing a, a song, a deep wound song on stage one night. And then I also ended up like seeing him, he was doing his Stooges thing with Mike Watt and in yeah. London. And I ended up actually chatting to him there. And then I, then I went to one of his solo shows out at the House of Blues in Anaheim uh, when I was living in LA, and so it wasn't totally crazy that we got together, but um, but it was, you know, it still was pretty pretty out there. <laughs> I mean, had you obviously, you know, you're a guy who uh, who uh, deep resentment is not a stranger to you, so uh, you know, Freed Pig is one of the most you know, hysterically overwrought, um, knee jerk resentment things I've ever heard in my life. It's such a classic. Um, so had you, did you get that out of your system and move on with your life or did it always bug you that this was hanging? Was it an albatross or had you? No, actually, I'd actually, I do, I'd actually worked through it pretty well. The songs really helped. And then yeah, yeah. Sebado, Sebado doing, I mean, writing the songs really helped and then Sebado doing pretty well. <laughs> Yeah, totally yeah. helped. Yeah. You know, that really helped. And then, uh, yeah, so by the time, you know, by the time the late 90s rolled around, you know, I was like, I mean, you know, I mean, or, and especially just after the, you know, my, you know, the late, the, you know, 99 into 2000 was so deeply humbling and just a terrible period for me that I, I don't know. I guess at some point I, I guess I was just, I don't know, resent, I just, I think, I think Azarad's book actually, cause I had spent so much time talking to Azarad and like, you know, really detailing my resentment. And, and then when I, and I read it, I was like, here, I, I had my say, you know, so here I'm like reading it in this book and I finished it and I was like, that's fucking depressing. <laughs> like, like, that's awful. Like, like it's that's depressing. just, it's also funny if you're on the outside looking in. It is, you know, I did it. I definitely did it from like the point of view. I mean, I did it because I, I love dirt. You know, I love hearing dirt. I love it when people talk openly and honestly and bitterly about things. You know, it's always interesting. But I think when I when I really read it and I saw the story in black and white, I was just sort of like, I don't know if I really. That's not. I don't know if that's me. You know, I'm like, I don't know if I really. You know, because actually, you know, I don't it just seemed sad for the first time, huh. you know, reading it. I just thought I was like, well, that's a sad story. So when the opportunity came up to work with them, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll do that. And it was great. 
Well, so. it certainly is a huge surprise because I mean, you know, now your your career is, you know, it's not it's a the funny thing is, it, there's so many parallels with the zombies, right? So you have this super short, white hot career, and then tons of time go by, and you get back together. But the difference is, uh, the zombies uh, getting back together was only a conceptual triumph, mm, right? And you guys have the real thing. I mean, you have uh, the albums are legitimately great, one after the other. And that's got to feel good because, I mean, you, I'm, I'm sure you know how good they are. So I don't I mean, I, I enjoy playing live so much. I'm not. Um, yeah, the, the the record thing is like, is, you know, I mean, it, it, those are like, those are Jay's thing. Oh, really? <laughs> to, <laughs> kind of, yeah, because you kind of, I mean, I, I've, I've been, I've been trying to, I've been working ways to integrate myself more into it as we go along. Mm -hmm. Um you know, and like, like, like the last, the last two records, the, or actually this last record was the idea was to have Jay play bass on my songs, which worked out really well. And then, um, you know, uh, but Jay has a very, he has a very specific way of working. So every record that we do has been recorded in the same way, you know, so. so do you, is, are you feeling the, the, the need to integrate your your sound into the dino sound because certainly you know what's initially striking about the stuff you were contributing uh to the records were how they stood out yeah i don't i don't well i think i, I am oh yeah that's always an effort to integrate myself into it you know to, to utilize the power of the band you know yeah like the band the band has a lot of power so i want to utilize that power i don't want to like right. walk in and you know i'm, I'm not you know I'm not going to do a, put a home, another home recorded piece on the record. I'm going to actually try to like really sit and figure out a way to use the power of the band. So that's, that's what I'm, I guess that's my main goal. And then, yeah. you know, I'm, I guess my, like, I just, and I, you know, I just, I think of, I make simple goals for like each record that we do. Like I'm like, you know, for this last one, I thought I really wanted Jay to write the, I want, I wanted Jay and Murph to write the drum parts together. Cause that hadn't really happened. I was like, cause Jay's the, he's a really inventive, really creative drummer. And that's kind of, all of his songs are actually come from his rhythm tracks, you know, that's so, so I kind of had to, I had to sort of figure a way to like, just ask him <laughs> like, Jay, right. can, can you write drum parts for my songs? Because it was sort of, I didn't really know because at first I felt like I had to produce everything and I didn't know if he would have time to do that or if he wanted to do that. So so I, so each record is like just me kind of getting the courage to like ask for a little bit more in the way a little bit more just so I can just integrate more with him and integrate my sound into that as well and then I don't know hopefully like you know just stumble on something really great you know I mean it seems like for a guy who is you know doing a lot of chanting in order to center himself that he'd probably be willing to uh to accommodate you. <laughs> yeah, he's he he is but it, but he's also like you know it's it's I think it, it's probably like this with fa I mean it is like this with families. I mean maybe not so much my family experience but I think you know Jay is like this kind of like older brother. I mean there's people who i mean even though we're pretty much the same age but i i do take a very i i do look up to him in a lot of ways and i trying to find an e trying to be his equal is like a really interesting <laughs> interesting challenge for me because i don't because what, what i we still do have our history and our history was pretty you know i was really it was really rough it was like it was a rough you know that those first years with him and in the band were, were really difficult and really you know i really you know i i don't know it was it was i was i'd never really had anybody bully me before <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i never really i think because jay always he would always say like lou is that kind of kid that was always bullied and pushed around and i'm like I never was. I mean, I, I cause I was kind of crazy. Cause I was, when I grew up, I was like pretty unpredictable. Like people didn't really mess with me because I, I was, I was capable of like, yeah, really, yeah. really yeah. freaking out. So I, I, I was, uh, so, 
Jay really threw me for a loop when he just told me that he was just treated me like I was someone that could be bullied. And I, I didn't really, he was really the first person to bully me. And I, is it I, uh, weird? I mean, it sounds like maybe I'm just uh, making it uh, kind of overly facile, but it, it seems like a lot of the bedrock of the, of your, you know, your collaborative endeavors from the very beginning were, were based in disharmony. So is it, does it feel <laughs> fucked up and wrong to be in a situation now that, that is healthy and accommodating? No. I don't feel well, like I don't I'm know. Just... If it, you know, I mean, if you're used to one thing you know, for decades. Well, it was, it wasn't really, I mean, to be honest, like my experience with Jay in the beginning was very short, really. I mean, it was really, it really comes down to just right. a couple of, it comes down to a couple of years, you know, yeah, that, yeah. Reverber, that reverberated, of course, across <laughs> decades, sure. but, sure. but, um, uh, you know, it's like, it really just comes, I mean, I don't know. I like, I, I like, I like happy endings. <laughs> Yeah. yeah <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. So I I really I <laughs> so, so you know I mean to me it's like I mean I got back together with Eric, you know, and that, that was I mean I got back together with Eric in 2006 and that was like after I mean I spent two solid years like exchanging I mean pages and pages long emails and explanations and mathematical equations and <laughs> you know to to really regain his trust and and bring him back to the band you know to bring him back on the road and to reissue 703 and i don't know you know i, I like reunions <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, yeah. yeah well i mean you have you know one of the happier reunion stories certainly in music <laughs> history <laughs> Seriously, if I was going to do a list of like the best, <laughs> and most uh, you know propitious uh, reunion stories in rock history, it would, you guys would be top on the list, top five for sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, before we uh, uh, expertly wend our way back and weave back into the Odyssey and Oracle era, mm. um, any advice for the uh, the hopelessly fucked? Uh, bedroom recording kids out there in the universe of what to how to take the reins <clears throat> i don't know just do something weird and keep just do it like something really weird <laughs> it's all about doing weird something weird and can just continually continuing to do it so do something weird and then beat that shit to death with a beat stick. the shit to death with a stick <laughs> okay i mean that's the beat you know it's like it's like Bill Callahan's probably a better example of that, you know. I mean, he really he found a unique voice and then just slowly and just inexorably moved towards, you know, the genius that he you know that he produces now. And they did back then. He has one song that will objectively stand as the best song he ever does. Um, it hit me during an acid trip in Lawrence, Kansas in <laughs> in July 96. Uh, and I played it over and over again, maybe 150 times. <laughs> what song is The Orange Glow of a Stranger's Living Room. Oh my God, I don't know that one. It's wow. his best song. And it's got um, in, in like a absolute anvil on the head lyric. Oh God. Um, I kind of just want to play it for you. Hold on a sec. <laughs> It's totally worth it. it it's so beautiful. Um, can't what record is it on? It's on an EP called Kicking a Couple Around. Oh, God. Oh, right. Okay. I have that. Um, I've got that record. And if it didn't hit you before, it's it's like the kind of song like, what the fuck? How have I not noticed this? It just kind of sits, sits back there. Um, all right. Here we go. Um I'm scared. Here it is. I'm scared. Wait, hold on a sec. Country roads and 
Just, it doesn't get much better than that. Nice. It, it really doesn't. <laughs> it's it's kind of dangerous uh, to listen to that 150 times on Ellis. <laughs> I have to tell you from personal experience. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. Well, look, I would be pleased as punch to continue wending your way back and forth through an unprecedented interview slash discography episode. Let's go back to Odyssey and Oracle, but I want to thank you for your candor <clears throat> and tell you that, you know, your 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 life and the things that you've done has made an aesthetic difference in my life. And I know many others as well in the same position. Right. <clears throat> so thanks, brother. You're welcome. <laughs> Man, am I proud of what just went down right there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Be sure to stay tuned because this Tuesday on Discography's The Private Press with Paul Major, we are foolhardily tackling Junior and his Solette's psychedelic sounds, which you absolutely have to hear the backstory behind this thing to believe it. It, re it redefines the phrase batshit crazy. And then there's this Thursday's wildcard episode featuring a surprise episode about a major band by a modern indie act. And then next Sunday, we've got part one of Jim Florentine rating Black Sabbath. Last but not least, a heartfelt discography thanks goes out to our graphic designer, Todd Zimmer, and my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason. I love you guys. We'll see you next week on Discography.